Thank you. Uh, first thing is uh, I, I want to thank uh, Francois, uh, the Collège de France, for making this, uh, this very nice uh, uh, meeting, uh, so friendly, open with the culture of the Collège. Um, and um, well, there is a little trace of my, of my genetics that, as you can see, goes back to Europe somewhere, uh, to Russia. But uh, which is, I left there an I instead of and uh, to signal uh, a Spanophone thing in the in the in the affiliation. Well, uh, when it, when when in the title was written revisiting the structuralist Keynesian neoclassical debate, I will I will sort of uh, focus. That was a nicer and more more. Uh, uh, media title, I will focus on a very strong debate in the late 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s that stands in the discussion on the macro policy and adjustment, and that you will see at certain points that you will find also in the developing, in the developed world, and today in, in Europe and the countries in crisis. What was the, the issue that goes from uh, theoretical discussion to uh, policy discussion and a divide in schools of interpretation of the facts of the theory and the recommendation. And that's why structuralists and neoclassicals are there. That's the way the people used to call themselves at the time. What I will do is an exercise of a sort of a history of economic thought, but that will prolong to the current issues. And uh, the structuralist versus the neoclassical controversies, but you will see that this will resist the passage of time in terms of economic issues in, macro, uh, in macroeconomics. We are on this part on the macroeconomics. In the development uh, research agenda of these days, macroeconomic has been a bit left aside and there is a strong predominance and a very welcome for some time predominance of micro issue. We will discuss about this balance in the, in the, in the coming minutes. The presentation proposes to revisit the debate on stabilization policies in the 70s and 80s, and I say beyond because if you open your mind, you will see current discussions in the, in the, in the transparencies. The relationship between devaluation, real wages, and unemployment, all names that come in the newspapers in this country every single day, but I'm just talking about development. Using the analytical tools available in those times, I will try to develop a simple general equilibrium uh, model with multiple equilibria to show that we can set a theoretical structure where this debate that at the time seemed to be between uh, un unreconcilable tribes can be put in a general model as particular cases. The, we may shed through this structure uh, uh, light and also a tribute to these controversies of the past, a dispute that seems then unsolvable, that was the word I couldn't get back, and had a major impact on economic policy. Well, the discussion on devaluation, a discussion that is in the policy arena on stabilization policy and macro policy all over the place, is that we can distinguish two effects and two successive phases. Given the time, I will go and focus uh, very directly on the issues. On the one hand, devaluation has a substitution effect. It changes competitiveness. When some people are talking about devaluing the euro, I'm going to talk in the, they are talking about this effect. They are thinking about this. When some people are saying, let's go out of the euro because the euro is not moving, they are discussing about this. We want competitiveness. This was the center of discussion in the developing macro world for decades. On the other hand, there is an income effect. A devaluation has changes, produces changes in real income. So we will work on these two effects that will drive our ambiguity. Devaluation until the 60s was based on the consensus on the positive effect of devaluation on employment. Devaluation was a bonus for employment. 
and the research was centered on a discussion on the martial learning condition developed in the 50s from the Keynesian basic framework of the open economy in a Keynesian model. However, the empirical evidence of the effects of devaluations in semi-industrialized economies, and there we go to development, in intermediate economies, not now the poor Asian economies of the 50s and 60s, not now the poor African economies of yesterday and today, but more the middle income economies that have a developed industrial sector, the observation of devaluation produced paradoxical effects. And then people started to ask questions. What did the literature say? Well, some people uh, highlighted the redistributive effects of devaluation in the sense of reducing real wages, increasing inequality, and producing a contraction in employment. This was discussed by the late Diaz Alejandro, an American economist that uh, contributed enormously to development economics, Brown and Joy, and Canitro, uh, an, an economy just also uh, recently deceived. What did, did these models have in common? A sector of production of a tradable good, with labor as the only input and inelastic domestic supply, whereas foreign demand is assumed to be infinitely elastic. What are we talking about? A sort of commodity sector that was traded, being agri or mining. A sector of production for non-tradable goods with infinitely elastic domestic supply, a Keynesian type of structural model for this sector, supply is determined by demand. A small or zero elasticity of substitution in the domestic demand for the two goods. The first good will be typically a wage good uh, uh, that satisfies basic consum consumption, and the second good will be the modern sector good, as it was talked before, that will be the industrial or manufacturing good. The experience of Argentina set the stylized fact for these papers with the meat and grain sectors at wage goods that are consumed and exported, and with very inelastic demand by then, and it, but it goes well beyond this case. You can go to Brazil, you could go to Chile, to Uruguay, to other Latin American countries, and also to many Middle East or African or Asian countries where you have this basic structure of a wage good that is on one hand a manufactured good and on the other hand an exportable good. This literature on devaluation had different views. I will go very quickly through it. There was a monetarist framework where a devaluation could be contractionary. That means have a negative effect on employment through the channel of the financial sector contracting the, uh, the financial wealth and then reducing real income and con real consumption. The Sidrowski, uh, an economist for Chicago at those times, find this, the, uh, started with this argument. Real and monetary contractionary effect were developed by Krugman and, and, and Taylor a bit later. And then we have a literature that is close to, to France, which is all the disequilibrium literature that was developed by, essentially by Baro Grossman, then by Lejean Houfoud, Benassi Malenvaux in our lands, and in this tradition, there were a number of papers and contributions where the extension was to an open economy. The basic models of the disequilibrium literature was a closed economy. So it was extended to the open economy. And there you have Dixit, Neri, Stegum, Michael Bruno, Arida Basha. And what was the result? A devaluation had a positive effect on employment. So the theory was rejoining the old consensus. In this line, I developed myself in 83, 87, uh, uh, a model based on this equilibrium that I will use partly today, restating and revisiting the discussion, that uh, brought ambiguity. What is the structure of this ambiguity? First, what sort of economy are we describing and we want to model? An economy where the local industry is strongly protected, against external competition and often oligopolistic in structure. 
The country imports raw materials and capital goods. The economy is a price taker for imported goods. That means it's a rather small economy. And a significant proportion of exports are primary good, where the country is a price taker. But the country has industrial exports. The country has a limited market power, is still a small country. The degree of competitiveness of local production plays a significant role, and there the devaluation increases the, the advantage in price of this country and will stimulate exports. International movements of private and public capital are restricted and in certain periods exogenous. The distribution of, of income, wages and profits determines aggregate consumption and savings, a sort of Caldorian view on distribution and, and, and behavior of consumption. This gives us, if, in a very synthetic and, and, and simple form, I, a lot of the, of the assumptions here can be relaxed. This country can be open to imports. It will not change the essentials. But how, this is how the, the, the controversy started. I, I will not discuss here because of time, but we can complexify this basic framework and it wouldn't change the uh, fundamental results. So we will have a tradable sector and not a non-tradable good and also a semi-tradable good. The tradable good is a price taker in international markets. Production is determined by supply. Domestic consumption and export are the destiny of this production. The semi-tradable good that we call N is an imperfect substitute for foreign goods, like cars or refrigerators or, or textile. It can be exported. In this sense, in the literature, you will call this good neither a non-tradable, neither a tradable. It's an exportable in the literature. We will call it a semi-tradable. It's consumed by households and the public sector. It's protected from imports. I could relax this hypothesis. It wouldn't change the basics. The sector is olig oligopolistic, and the price is driven by a markup rule, a fixed rule of markup. Exports depend on the degree of competitiveness relative to foreign goods. This is the, 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 the expression, the analytical expression of the price of the foreign of the semi-tradable goods, it's the cost of labor W with the input of labor per unit of production AN, plus the intermediate good that you use to produce this this good. Let's assume that you produce a car in Brazil, and this car is produced out of labor and of imported uh, electronic equipment or auto parts, and then you have the GN, which is the markup of the of the, of the profit. We will assume for simplicity that international price of the intermediate good is fixed. The two goods are complementary in household consumption. CPI is your med, the, the consumer price index, is a geometric mean of the prices of the tradable and semi-tradable good. PN the price of the industrial good, the semi-tradable good, the exportable good, is an international, is, is divided by E, the exchange rate, times the international price of this good, give us the competitiveness index. That means the domestic price of the good divided by the exchange rate, corrected by the competing price abroad, give us the indicator of how competitive I am. Setting PN star, the international price, as one, again to simplify, I will have a form of a real exchange rate of the industrial good. And then we can write the demand equation for this good, the export demand equation, as a function of the real exchange rate for this good. The price of the car divided by the exchange rate gives me the price in dollars or euros, and I compete with the rest of the world. The, 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 when the PN 
means the price of the good relative to the exchange rate increases, it, it means that my good becomes more expensive and then I export less. This is standard. What happened with the tradable sector? This tradable sector is a price taker. Let's assume in a very simple case I produce a commodity. This commodity is my capacity of production and it uses a number of people to produce it. If it's land, like it was discussed, it's a finite given land at a certain point in time. And this sector is always at full production. How do, do, do I link employment with production? The level of, um, of employment, effective employment in the industrial sector is determined by the short side of the market. In a very Keynesian form of a fixed price model, this will depend on the demand and the supply will adjust. So it will be either the demand or the maximum available labor in the economy. My limit is the labor at disposal in the economy. We will assume, and we can do other alternative assumptions, that the tradable good has priority if effective demand for employment is higher than the total labor supply of the economy. So we will have an equation that tells us that the demand of labor of the industrial sector will be a function of the demand for the good times the quantity of labor per unit of car. That gives us the following equation, depending on private consumption determines demand, the public expenditure determines demand, and the exports that we have defined. Depending on all these factors of demand, I will have the total demand for the industrial good, the semi-tradable good, the car, the textile, the refrigerator. That times the input of labor, the quantity of labor for unit of good, will give me the total demand. 10 minutes have gone or 10 minutes are left? Left. Left? <laughs> wow. OK, so we will have to accelerate strongly. Trust me. We will accept that if there is rationing, that means if I don't have enough labor to satisfy the demand, that the government decides that has a priority and this is domestic consumption. I can change this hypothesis, but it's a, an often uh, practical policy. People have to be voted. They first serve the domestic demand and then they serve exports and they pay the price if necessary. So that will be our assumption. Another assumption will not dramatically change our results. We will define the price elasticity of export demand. Real wages and employment, a rise in wages will have a positive income effect. When wages increase, I increase demand because it depends on real income. But on the other hand, I become less competitive, competitive and I have a substitution effect that is negative. The income effect, the positive income effect, is the following. A rise in real wages increases the demand of the semi-tradable good. The positive effect of employment of an increase in real wages depends positively on labor intensity of the production of the good, on the income elasticity of consumption demand for this good. On the other hand, I have a substitution effect, the negative effect of the increase on real wages. It reduces, a rise in real wages reduces the degree of competitiveness of the domestic sector, uh, industrial sector, and therefore leads to a decrease in exports of this good. The substitution effect will be stronger when the price elasticity for export demand of N is big, when the unit cost contribution of wages is big, and when the proportion of the workforce linked to exports in the demand of this good is important. The more I export, the more the substitution effect will be strong on employment. 
the negative substitution effect. So a more open economy, when I increase wages, will suffer more than a less open economy. That gives us this, and this is the clue of, of the multiple equilibrium game. We have a nonlinear demand for labor. LD is the demand for labor. L is the total supply of labor, L star. W is the real wage. So we have a division in two words. To the left of L star, it's a Keynesian word. Not everybody is in poem. So you have an employment to the left, left of L star. To the right of L star, you have overemployment and excess demand for labor. The economy is overheated. To the north, you will have a section that we'll call the structuralist section. When there is a, a, an, an increase in real wages, the demand for labor is increasing. You see the curve is upward moving. That means that we are in what was called the structuralist world. In that region, the income effect is higher than the substitution effect. When real wages increase, demand for labor increases. The RR uh, dividing, uh, uh, dividing line sets the two regions, the structuralist world to the north and the neoclassical world to the south. In the neoclassical world, an increase in wages reduces labor demand. Why? Because the income effect is lower than the substitution effect. In a more open economy, beware if you increase wages without productivity gains. This is more or less, if you want to think about the developed world, the problem of the small developed economies of Scandinavia or uh, Northern Continental Europe. This is the external equilibrium, exports of the two goods minus imports plus F, net capital flows. That allows us to do a classical external constraint. The BB curve determines equilibrium in the external sector. That is telling us that the economy will not have a balance of payment crisis as long as the IM on the BB line. The point E is a full employment situation with an equilibrium of the balance of payments. You know that developing countries very often and very, very often face financial crisis and balance of payment crisis. They have strong devaluations and comes the IMF to save them or the World Bank is helping. I will skip this. And this gives me the general equilibrium of the economy. On the left-hand side, you will see that we have multiple equilibria here. On the left-hand side, it's a structuralist equilibrium. The economy in the point E has equilibrium in the external sector and in the internal sector. Full employment and no disequilibrium in foreign currency. On the right-hand side, we have the neoclassical equilibrium, which is the E. We have global equilibrium, but in the southern region where a devaluation expands the economy. In the north, a devaluation contracts the economy. The two words that seem unsolvable in the debate are here consistent to one and only one vision with multiple equilibrium and multiple regimes. What happens with stabilization policy? A typical disequilibrium story is that the, we have an economy at full employment, but the balance of payment is in deficit. In the structural, structuralist regime, solving the external disequilibrium requires a fall in real wages. What are people talking, north and south, when you have disequilibrium, excessive external debt, balance of payment problems, you have to devalue, you have to reduce real wages. A rise in the real exchange rate is a reduction in real wages, but the devaluation 
may not be sufficient to reach global equilibrium, we will need something else. The fall in the real wage, in the structuralist word, in the left equilibrium, implies a contraction of production and a contraction of total employment through the negative impact on the consumption of the semi-tradable good. It must be compensated by an increase in absorption, public spending or a tax reduction. Here we see an example. If I am in full employment at point H and I devalue, what will happen? I will go to point G in the structuralist world. We are in the left-hand side equilibrium. What I will need is to expand the demand for labor with an exogenous factor like public expenditure to reestablish equilibrium at the point E. So if I contract, I will go further away from equilibrium. In the neoclassical regime, the right-hand side word, the stabilization problem is different. Restoring global equilibrium requires a reduction in absorption. And this is the typical recommendation that is extended to everybody that when you devalue, contract deficit or reduce surplus. A reduction in, requires a reduction in absorption, lower public expenditure and high taxes, contrary to the structuralist equilibrium. The standard IMF stabilization program is a devaluation of the real exchange rate, a fall in real wages required by the disequilibrium, but also a decrease in the budget deficit. But the policy compact is only optimal in certain cases, as we will show. What happens if we do the neo in the neoclassical regime? Let's assume we are in H. We will be in deficit of the foreign sector, but in full employment. When I devalue, because the substitution effect is very strong, the economy expands and I go to F and generate excess demand for labor. I need a contractionary public policy not to have inflation and reestablish equilibrium at E, which is a contrary case from the previous analysis. But what happens if I do this in the structuralist regime? That means I make the same policy in the wrong place. A devaluation with the squeeze in absorption will overkill, and that was the fear of the structuralist economies of the 70s and 80s. From H, I will go to G, and if I contract, I will go to I. That means I will solve the external problem, but I will overkill the economy in terms of employment. I will not discuss all these cases, but I only want to mention one thing, which is there is a, an interesting issue that was not discussed in the past, which is the dynamics. We have done comparative statics. We shock an economy here, and we see it there. But we have to explain how the economy was, goes from here to there. And one of the results, interesting, is that if the structuralists had the, their word right on certain issues, they had it wrong on the dynamics. Their models were not stable from a dynamic point of view, but nobody at the time studied the dynamics. The neoclassical equilibrium with full employment is stable. The, structural, uh, the structuralist equilibrium with full employment is unstable. So. The whole literature has a failure here in the critique side of the controversy. Let's assume that the labor market adjusts by an excess of, excess of demand for labor. Look at the north. The equilibrium, ES, is the structuralist equilibrium from before. If I have an excess demand, real wages increase. Because demand increases due to the income effect, the excess demand prolongs and the economy explodes. This is typically a hyperinflation problem. If I have a contraction and I go to the left, real wages decrease. 
But because the income effect is stronger than the substitution effect, the economy keeps contracting and keeps contracting and goes further away from equilibrium. The equilibrium is unstable. Where does this economy stabilize when the substitution effect becomes so strong after a long, long contraction that the economy opens up and the, the world becomes neoclassical? If the world goes from structuralist to neoclassical, you regain stability. Another solution is what happens in reality. At a certain point, unions and political parties resist the resu reduction in wages and stop the process. This is the equilibrium with wage resistance. What is the cost? Permanent unemployment. The economy will not go back to full employment. We can solve this problem using two reaction functions. If the government reacts to this equilibrium in uh, the external sector with a devaluation and uses fiscal policy to adjust to unemployment, we can turn the structuralist equilibrium into a stable equilibrium. I'm not going to do all the mathematics here that are related to stability conditions. Conclusion. What we can see here is that using the analytical tools available in the times of this controversy and extending through uh, a bit of upgrading today, both regimes, structuralist and neoclassical, could be rationalized as two particular cases of the same model. The lesson for policy making is that the optimal economic policy has to turn to empirical analysis to identify the characteristic of the equilibrium before going to policy recommendations. This is the structuralist message. The name structuralist comes from in the line with the new structuralism that Danny Roddick evoked on a more growth perspective. On the macro short run perspective, this comes again is read the structure of the economy to develop the appropriate model. And that requires, and then we are recouping the structuralist message, even if we see the uh, fragilities of the models that were used. The degree of openness of an economy is a central driver for the equilibrium characterization. The more open you are, the bigger the substitution effect, and the relation between the expansive and, and contracting effect will change. In a sense, it's a talk between tribes, intellectual tribes, but also between country experiences. On the one side, the Latin American closed economies and, and import substitution model of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s in front of the export-led Asian tigers. If we have to rethink today in a more complex uh, technical form or analytical form, we could introduce portfolio portfolio issues, capital flight, flexible action rate, public debt, and the main structure will still be alive. Thank you.